Welcome to Fantasia's fantastical podcast, That's So Wizard. Movies, games, comics, and more step into the spotlight. And be sure to head over to patreon.com slash Podcast to help support That's So Wizard. Here's your host, Andrew Fantasia! Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, good solstice. I don't know what time of day you're listening to this. You could That's the beauty of podcasts, right? You could be listening to this anytime, any place. Hopefully not any place. I mean, hopefully if you're, you know, somewhere important, you're not listening to me. Uh, but if you are, I'm still flattered. So you, you keep doing what you're doing. I'm Andrew Fantasia, and this is That's So Wizard. Thanks so much for tuning in to That's a Wizard, and today's going to be a little bit of a... I don't want to use the word special episode, because that makes me sound like a cheesy CW teen drama, but this is going to be kind of a special episode, because we're uh, we're doing things a little bit differently on the Rebel Scum Podcast Network uh, for the, the foreseeable future, and by foreseeable future, I just mean like the next month or so. Uh, you know, that's not to say that it's uh, everything is changing forever, but things are going to be done a little bit differently. And what I mean by that is that we're just tackling our podcasts and our videos and our general content in a sort of different manner to accommodate what's going on in the world. I know we're all tired of hearing about it. We're all tired of hearing about COVID-19 and how it's just sweeping Everything, everywhere, everywhere you look, you can't open your eyes without seeing COVID-19 being talked about or being written about or, or being panicked about, uh, depending what pocket of the universe you're in, because a lot of people are panicking and uh, people tend to do stupid things when they panic. I'm looking at you, people who hoard Lysol wipes. Uh, but this is an entertainment podcast. I'm here to talk about movies and television and fun stuff, and I am going to, I promise. Uh, but the reason I wanted to open with that is because... We are taking the time on Rebel Scum Podcast Network right now to kind of accommodate our content specifically towards people who uh, unfortunately have to work from home or just stay at home. We understand is what I'm struggling and failing to say. We understand that a lot of people are, uh, you know, they're disrupted right now because of what's going on in the world. You might have kids that you suddenly have to find care for if you're uh, not allowed to stay home from work. Or if you are staying home from work, now all of a sudden, you know, you're home all the time. And maybe that drives you nuts. Some people get a little screw crazy when they're home all the time. And that's perfectly okay. I, I can I totally understand that. So in this crazy world that we've suddenly been thrust into, I think what's most important is we all have to remember to have a little fun we all we can't forget to have fun because if we forget to have fun then what's even the point and what's more fun than talking about films talking about shows talking about all the stuff we talk about generally on that so wizard and that's what we're going to do today so first and foremost um i wanted to talk about uh the bad news i wanted to get the bad news out of the way first before i move on to the good news the bad news being how the world of entertainment has been affected by COVID-19 and what that means for us going forward. As of right now, as of time of recording, the world of movies has been very affected by COVID-19 in as much as a lot of the big films slated for 2020 uh, are no longer necessarily slated for 2020. Fast and the Furious 9, F9, The Fast Sack, whatever it's called. I don't know. Those movies have like eight titles each. They're like Middle Earth characters. F9. Let's just call it F9. It's supposed to come out in May. Now it's coming out next May. It's coming out in 2021. That is a huge shift. And that is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm, I'm going to probably say this a lot throughout this episode, but in the grand scheme of things, the idea of a movie changing release dates is probably the smallest problem in the world right now. I mean, let's be real. It barely even qualifies as a first world problem at this point. And I'm not even a Fast and Furious fan. I wasn't even planning on seeing F9. But I do feel bad for people who are, because that would suck. I mean, like, I look forward to things like Star Wars and Marvel movies with 
the kind of passion that I think most normal people look forward to their wedding days. You know, I am just a ball of anticipation for films like that. So if I was to be coming up on the release date of a film I have been just looking forward to with the type of joy people look forward to Christmas, and then it gets canceled for a year, I would probably cry a little bit. I'm not even joking. I, I would probably shed some tears of disappointment. Just, just for a bit. Even though F9 wasn't on my radar, even though I don't care about Dominic Toretto and his family, um, I know there are people out there who do. And maybe you're one of them. To which I say, like, with all sincerity, my friend, I am sorry for you. I'm bummed. That sucks that you won't get to see F9 for another year and a bit. That is really shitty, all things considered. It is. It's it's probably something you were looking forward to, you know, in this craziness that's been going on. You're probably like, well, at least I still get to go see F9 in May. And now that can't even happen. So it's... It is affecting people. Very, very small affecting. You know, these are just movies at the end of the day, but they are our bread and butter, so I love talking about them. But it is a shame. And the same thing has happened to A Quiet Place Part 2, which a lot of people have been looking forward to. A Quiet Place Part 2 was supposed to come out in a week. That's how soon it was. It was right around the friggin' corner. And now that has been delayed indefinitely we don't even know they haven't even selected a new time slot to drop a quiet place part two i just read this morning just as i turned on the microphone to start recording that another big film is probably going to be hit by this and that is shang chi and the legend of the ten rings uh which i'm not gonna lie is probably my most anticipated phase four marvel movie right now i was really looking forward to shang chi and what's going on with shang chi is that the director um, is afraid he might be positive for COVID-19. So production on first unit, at least, I just heard first unit production on Shang-Chi has been halted indefinitely until the director, uh, Daniel Destin Cretton, I think his name is, or Destin Daniel Cretton, um, until he gets his results back, they can't move forward with the movie, which makes sense because last I heard they were filming the movie in Australia, which is kind of a no-fly zone right now. I'm pretty sure, you know, Australia, Iran, China, and most of Europe are the places where you don't want to be. If I remember correctly, Shang-Chi was scheduled to come out May 2021. So from the looks of things, it's probably not going to hit that target. I hope I'm wrong. I hope this blows over in two weeks and then everything can go back to normal. But for those of us who had May 2021 marked on our calendars as, yes, Shang-Chi, I'm going to be there. Maybe uh, start writing down all these dates in pencil because you might need to erase and alter a few things. For me, though, the biggest hit film-wise, and I hope it stays this way. I hope nothing worse happens film-wise. But the biggest hit for me was James Bond, No Time to Die. Because uh, I don't know if you remember, but in the last episode of That's a Wizard... I was talking about my most anticipated movies of 2020, and folks, No Time to Die was number two for me. I love James Bond. Um, James Bond reminds me of my dad, who is sadly no longer with us. Dad and I uh, watch a lot of James Bond on TV, and this was the first Bond film to come out since his passing, so I was making a big deal of it. I had a whole night planned where my friends and I were going to get together and dress up as James Bond characters and go out and see it. I was doing a big thing on my channel, the Andrew Fantasia YouTube channel, where I was doing a 25-day countdown to James Bond retrospective, where every day I would release a huge, like, 20 to 25-minute long video about a different James Bond film leading up to No Time to Die. And I had half of those films shot, edited, and in the bag ready to go when the news dropped that No Time to Die was being delayed until November. I literally spent two weeks where seven days a week I was working eight hours a day and those eight hours every day were just eight hours of me making Bond content for my channel. It was editing, it was putting together those retrospectives, it was compiling them, doing research on them. That was a lot of work and I was doing it as quickly as possible and as intensely as possible because I wanted to hit a deadline and have the first James Bond video out by March 14th, which as is the time that I'm recording this is tomorrow. So tomorrow I would have kicked off and dropped the Dr. No episode if all had gone as planned. 
But sadly, that's no longer the case. And now I feel like I spent two weeks working myself to the bone for nothing. So I'm like, oh, man, that was a lot of expended energy that I didn't need to, you know, go crazy about. So that's the bad news. That's the bad news that we have gotten um, in the film and television world. Uh, as far as I know, for all I know, in the time it took me to say all this, uh, more has dropped because everything seems to be going at a faster and faster pace now. But we don't want to hear bad news all the time right now. We want to hear some good news too. So I want to make sure that this episode of That's So Wizard um, gives us something to look forward to. And I think the best and most obvious way to do that is just to take a look at this from the most cut and dry perspective, which is, okay, we are coming up on March break, right? It's spring break. Um, a lot of people have been advised not to travel. And I don't know about where you live, but where I live, uh, Toronto, Canada, every publicly funded school in the greater Toronto area has been officially closed for two extra weeks after March break. Uh, and the reasoning behind that was just in case some families decide to say, screw it, we're traveling anyway. So just in case, you know, a family goes somewhere, they come back and the kids might have picked up some viruses along the way. The schools didn't want to take that risk and have the kids come back, uh, you know, an influx of returning students after spring break, uh, just swapping DNA with each other and giving it, you know, spreading the COVID love. So what they decided was two weeks is enough time for the virus to play itself out. So if anybody comes back from spring break with anything, they just stay at home for two weeks and then school resumes. And hopefully that would prevent any crazy spreading from going on, at least as far as elementary and high school kids are concerned. And I think, you know what, I, I got to agree with them. I think that that's a good call. I really wish everybody in the world did that, and not just with schools. I mean, everybody, like, just close everything for two weeks. We're, trust me, we're going to be fine if nobody makes money for two weeks. I'm sure everybody will be okay. But regardless, we have spring break coming up. And then if you're anything like our current system here in the Toronto area, we got two extra weeks after that. So that's essentially three weeks where the kids don't have school. That's three weeks where you might possibly be told to work at home, you know? Things are, are uh, I don't wanna say crisis mode because that feels like I'm trying to stir the pot and make people uh, panic, but things are in a different mode than normal right now. We're, we're, at, uh, we're at a DEF CON level right now and we need to sort of uh, appreciate that without panicking, right? So three weeks at home, what are you gonna do? And at the end of the day, yeah, I know like, who am I? I'm nobody. I'm, I'm just some fool who comes on uh, to your to your earbuds and whisper sweet nothings to you about what's going on in the entertainment world. Um, I don't have all the answers. Nobody does. But because That's a Wizard is an entertainment podcast, I figured what better way to, um, you know, talk to my friends, talk to all of you listening, than to just give you some ideas. Just throw some ideas at you of how to spend your three weeks at home. Maybe it'll be less than three weeks. Maybe it'll be more than three weeks. We don't know. Frankly, I, I don't want to know. I just want to take it day by day at this point. But let's say, just for argument's sake, you're looking at three weeks ahead of you where the kids don't have school and you're working from home. What does that mean for you? How are you going to keep yourself entertained? How are you going to keep from going stir crazy? People might want to avoid movie theaters right now. Frankly, there's not much coming out. There would have been a quiet place, but that's no longer in the picture. So if you were starved up for entertainment and you head to the movie theater, you might not even uh, be heading to anything decent. I don't really know if there's much out. Uh, the Hunt is coming out. I think The Hunt is out today, but who knows if that's going to be good. Who knows if you're even looking forward to it or if you even care about The Hunt. So what can you do for three weeks? Well... I decided to compile a small little list here of just suggestions, uh, entertainment-wise, of course. At this point in time, I don't like making these kinds of assumptions, but at this point in time, I assume if you are a hardcore film or TV fan, you probably have one or two subscriptions to one or two streaming services. So what I want to do with you right now is I just want to run through the streaming services very quickly, very breezily, you know, we're not going to go, this isn't going to be a crazy four hour in-depth episode or anything like that, but I just want to run through them 
and suggest to you some things that you could watch, that you could spend your time on to make the time go by just a little bit faster. Now, I want to preface this with a couple things, all right? Like I said, I am coming from Canada here. I'm a homegrown Canadian boy, even though my background is Maltese and Italian. I was born in Canada. Um, and in Canada, we kind of get shafted sometimes on things like this just for stupid reasons that make no sense to me. Uh, and what I mean by that is American Netflix, you guys have different things than Canadian Netflix. That's just the way I don't know why makes no sense, but there it is. We don't have what you have. We also don't get certain packages. We don't get uh, like Hulu, for example. I am 99% sure Canada has no Hulu at all. So I can't recommend anything good on Hulu because, folks, I don't know what's on Hulu. For all I know, everything's on Hulu. For all I know, nothing's on Hulu. For all I know, I'm on Hulu. Somebody might upload these podcasts to Hulu and all the folks in the USA get to just turn on Hulu and listen to me, which, frankly, would be hilarious because I have no idea. But... That's just the way it works up here. No Hulu in Canada. So my focus right now is going to be on the Netflix, the Prime of Amazon, the Disney Plus, and the Crave slash HBO. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the flicks of the net. Let's start with the big red boss itself. You have Netflix, you have three weeks. What are you going to watch on Netflix? Well, I'm going to try to recommend uh, kind of an assorted flavor of things. So first of all, if you want to see, let's say, comedy slash romance, like a rom-com kind of thing, I would recommend the show Love. It's just called Love, plain and simple. Uh, there are three seasons, I believe, and it's over. So once you watch the three, you've seen the whole show now. Uh, Love is really spectacularly written. Um, I think, personally, it's the most, I have to stress that again, the most realistic portrayal of modern dating slash romance that I have ever seen in anything, period. Um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a bold claim. I know, it's a bold claim, but that, I, I gotta... I gotta stick by that claim, guys. I have to. Love really does do the trick. And I think, you know, the title is so simple, but it's poignant in that way because of how true to life it is. It's just like, hey, you're getting love. Whatever that means in 2020, that's that's what you're getting, even though the show was made like four years ago or something. It's kind of old now. But uh, yeah, love. Uh, you won't be disappointed unless you hate that kind of thing, in which case, yeah, maybe you will be disappointed, but don't worry, I'm going to steer you into different waters, waters that you would be more inclined to sail through, because let's say you are not a fan of rom-coms, let's say you're an animation fan. If you're an animation fan, then I'm going to drop a, a little curveball on you, I'm going to drop Castlevania your way, all right? Uh, Castlevania is something that I actively avoided when it was first coming out, because I, spoilers, um, spoilers for me, not for the show, but I can't stand Japanese anime. I just, I can't stand it. I don't like it at all. And when I saw Castlevania come out, it had an anime style to the art. I was like, Ooh, no, thank you. But then I was told by people like, Hey, look, it's not really a Japanese anime. It just kind of looks like it. And, uh, they also said, don't be put off by the fact that it's based on a video game because it's actually good. So I was like, whoa, okay, those are two very bold statements you made. So I watched the first two seasons of Castlevania, and they are very short seasons. I think they're like six episodes each or something like that. And man, those people who told me to watch Castlevania, they weren't kidding. Because that was, A, not a Japanese anime. It just looked like one, so they were right about that. They were also right about the fact that it is very good considering it's based off a of video game property. In fact, I'm going to make another bold statement here. I will go so far as to say that Castlevania is the best film slash TV adaptation of a video game ever made. The Mortal Kombat movie, yeah. The Rampage movie, yeah. The Sonic the Hedgehog movie, yeah. But if you want to really wet your whistle with something substantial, Castlevania, man, that show stunned me with how cool it was. Uh, if you're an old school NES fan, 
It's based more off of the plot of Castlevania III Dracula's Quest. Uh, that's a deep cut NES reference out there for anybody who knows what I'm talking about. But uh, the story and the characters really draw from that. And the theme music might be my favorite part of it because I'm the type of person, I'm really old school, where I don't really care for vampires. I just don't, unless they are classical vampires in the sense that the stories they are in take place in the Middle Ages. I don't care about vampires walking around in modern day L.A., and just being like, I'm a vampire. Trust me, I look like a normal dude, but I'm totally a vampire. Like, I don't care about that stuff. But the idea of a vampire in a castle, deep in a forest, next to a Germanic village, like, that stuff is... I, I live for that stuff. I love the idea of that. And that's all Castlevania, baby. That is all old school, like, European Germanic mythology vampire lore. And on top of that, you get this theme song that just sounds like the creepiest choir of monks in an old cathedral, you know, somewhere in like Romania, just singing with this deep bass about this horrible, scary, satanic thing going on. And there's all these vampires and bats fluttering through the air. It is the most atmospheric shit you will ever see. I can't recommend Castlevania enough. But Castlevania is very violent and scary. And that show Love is very R-rated and very mature. So let's say you got kids. Those kids are home with you. They're not going to school. What are you going to watch with the kids? Well, here's two quick options. Number one, The Flash. The CW show The Flash is there on Netflix uh, right now. The uh, The DC shows are tween friendly. I don't know if they're kid friendly. Uh, I don't know if I would... You know, I don't know if a seven-year-old would get any joy out of watching Flash. They probably would. But the, the Flash show is is very safe. You know, there's nothing crazy to it. You're not going to scar your kids for life. Plus, it's superheroes. And who doesn't love that? And it's also cheesy, low-budget superheroes because it's the CW. So you could start them with Flash and then you can work them up to the, to the you know, bigger and better big kid stuff. The, the Marvels and the DCs, you know, you can move them up to that. Even Flash is DC. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. But... I have an even better recommendation for you if you have kids and you have Netflix. Two great tastes that taste great together, as far as I'm concerned, are fantasy and puppets. So it is with zero hesitation that I recommend to you The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. The Dark Crystal was, you know, that 80s Jim Henson movie that uh, kind of was became a cult hit. You might know it, you might not know it. It's a very slow movie. It's it's very strange. It almost puts you in a trance with the with the way it's paced. Uh, it's it's not for everybody, and I understand that. But then along comes Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. It came out last summer, and it took my breath away. It was so cool. It was just this huge, epic fantasy with all these moving pieces and different characters and s- huge celebrity cast. Like, every major character was played by somebody I recognized. And to top it all off, it's all Jim Henson puppets, and they all look spectacular. I can't stress enough how great the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance was. And it's perfectly suitable for kids. Just like in the 80s when you had stuff like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Yes, it's a bit creepy and sinister. Yes, your kid might look at a puppet and be like, ooh, that scares me. But it's not going to scar them. They're going to be enraptured by this. They're going to love what they're watching. They're going to be swept up in a big fantasy adventure that frankly is, uh, you know, it, it's Joseph Campbell levels of classical So they're going to get a classical storytelling archetype through these puppets. I Like, trust me, you and your kids will enjoy the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. I don't know if they're putting out more seasons of that. Right now there's only one season. So it might be a short-lived thing, but it is well worth it. And it serves as a prequel to the movie. So if your kids love that, then you can put on the movie after and they can find out how the story ends. All right, let's move on to Amazon Prime. Now, this might be my least favorite streaming service. I don't know. I find that on Amazon Prime, you have uh, you have a lot of bottom-of-the-barrel stuff that's kind of stuck on there. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. I like, uh, you know, I like a good documentary every now and then. And I remember when I first got Amazon Prime about a year ago, I was flitting through the documentaries trying to find something interesting. And I watched three documentaries, and every single one was so low-budget... It looked like I made it. And I can't make good stuff, folks. So 
I don't know if Amazon Prime just has this thing where if anybody makes a documentary like on their cell phone, they will upload it for you. I don't know, but that's how it felt. So if you have Amazon Prime, you probably know what I'm talking about. There's there's a, a severe lack of quality control on there, but there is some good stuff. If you're looking for shows to binge, I'm going to recommend two things. I'm going to recommend Mr. Robot and The Man in the High Castle. Mr. Robot is about hackers. You probably are familiar with it because Rami Malek, who is the star, has exploded. He's now the most famous guy in the universe. And he's the new James Bond villain, even though that movie is not coming out for nine months. Don't remind me. But it's a very timely look at society through the lens of an anarchist who is fed up with the way the system works. Uh, That seems to be a running theme nowadays. People are really getting tired of the one percenters and the power they have over everybody else. And Mr. Robot uh, is a um, microcosm of that. Then you've got the man in the high castle, which I haven't gotten very far into yet. Um, I've only gotten about halfway through season one. But I have to say, so far, everything I have seen is amazing. It is well acted. It is well paced. It is well written. It is well directed. Everything about this just screams quality, which is rare, as I said, on Amazon Prime. The Man in the High Castle is uh, an alternate dystopian future. It takes place in a parallel universe where Hitler won, essentially. Hitler won the war, so now the, the Nazi empire has kind of taken over the world. And it shows you what the world looks like if that had happened. That's it. That's all the setup you need for The Man in the High Castle. But of course, considering everything going on in the world today, considering the very reason the topic of this podcast exists. Maybe you don't want to watch something as heavy and dark as that. Maybe you don't want to see things about dystopian futures and whatnot. In which case, I totally understand. Um, Amazon Prime has some interesting movie selections too, but I find that most of their movies are schlocky, not even B movies, but more C movies. Again, they're real bottom of the barrel stuff there, I find. But if you're a fan like me of really bad, cheesy, low-budget, like, 80s horror movies, for example, like the kind of stuff, uh, like, Roger Corman would have been putting out, the kind of stuff Troma would have been putting out, you can find a lot of that in Amazon Prime. It's hidden. You gotta dig. You gotta dig a little bit, but it's there. I would recommend uh, a movie called House. I think it's still up on there. House is a horror movie from the 80s. You might be able to still find it on Amazon Prime. But I would also recommend, even more so... A little film called Chopping Mall. Chopping Mall is an 80s movie where there are a bunch of kids who get locked in a mall after hours. And they're stuck in there. And the mall is being patrolled by three robots who kill any intruders they come across. That's the setup of Chopping Mall. And it's full of just wonderful 80s goodness. Uh, And if you're like me and you like seeing old malls from the 70s and 80s where there's old stores in there that don't exist anymore. Dude, Chopping Mall is like a gold mine for that. Every shot, every frame has something in it that doesn't exist anymore. That's one of my favorite B-movies. I've been trying to find it on DVD for like ever, but as far as I know, it's still on Amazon Prime. So if you want to get a little bit nostalgic, see some robots kill some teenagers, you can't go wrong there. Now let's cross over the borders into the territory of Crave slash HBO. I don't even know if it's called anything different uh, outside of Canada, but here it's just Crave HBO, because there's a lot of goodness to be had there, particularly if you're in the market to binge watch some TV shows, because it is full of TV shows. As far as I know, I haven't checked 100%, but as far as I know, the library on Crave HBO is just full of every episode of every HBO show ever made, I think. So if you want to watch Oz, if you want to watch The Wire, or The Sopranos, or Game of Thrones, it's all on there. It's all on Crave HBO. So that alone could hold you over for however many weeks COVID-19 keeps us shut in like this. There's so much there. There are also movies there. Uh, and you'll find like a... a, a decent assortment you'll find you know new movies old movies there's a movie i found that was exclusive to crave hbo that came out i think two years ago called my dinner with Hervé. and if you're a game of thrones fan it stars peter dinklage Tyrion lannister 
and it's a biographical film. He is playing Hervé Villachez, who is the uh, little actor who you might remember from Fantasy Island. He was Tattoo in Fantasy Island. Ziplane, Ziplane. He was that guy. Um, and that's this, it's the story of his life uh, as told to a reporter. Uh, because in real life, Hervé Villachez told his life story to a reporter one fateful night um, in the early 90s. And very shortly after, I think just like a month after, uh, sadly, Mr. Villachez took his own life. He shot himself. Uh, so that was his final interview. And it was a very illuminating interview, and they turned it into this movie on HBO. Uh, it's not for kids, definitely not for kids, but it's uh, it's a wonderful look at this actor's life. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but these kind of biography films always really stick with me. I love hearing people's life stories. I think that's why I love Citizen Kane so much, because it is, at the end of the day, a biography, just not of an actual living human being. It's a fictional biography. But if you want to binge some shows on HBO Crave, you are, you know, you're set. Right now, I'm actually binging Arrow, the DC show that's set in the same universe as Flash, because I've never seen Arrow before, and I have seven years worth of Arrow to catch up on. There's seven seasons of that show, so guess what? I'm going to be binging Arrow for at least three weeks, if not more. Uh, I've been working my way through the first season, and I'm having a lot of fun. Again, this is something you could theoretically show your kids. I think if they're 10 and up, they'll dig it. Anything younger, they might get bored or they might just not understand what's going on. But it's a superhero show. It's cheesy. It's CW, so everybody looks like a supermodel. So you get to look at beautiful people for seven seasons. And it's set in the DC Universe, which for me is the coolest universe in comics. Sorry, Marvel. I love your movies, but your, your comics leave a little bit to be desired sometimes. That's a, that's a whole other topic for a whole other day. So almost all ages can enjoy Arrow, but for the grown-ups... I'm going to recommend something really hardcore for you here on Crave HBO, okay? I'm going to recommend Westworld. Now, Westworld, if you were to ask me right now, I would say to you, Westworld is the best show on television right now, maybe, uh, and one of the best shows ever made. Uh, And that's just my personal opinion, but Westworld is something special. It really is. It's a science fiction show about... The theme park, Westworld, the the Michael Crichton story. Uh, If you're not familiar with it, I don't want to spoil anything. I would just say watch the first episode of Westworld and just that'll dictate whether or not you're going to like the show. It is written by Jonathan and Christopher Nolan and Lisa Joy, though. So if you're familiar with Jonathan Nolan and Christopher Nolan, you know that their writing can get a little ponderous, right? They write things that are very slow, very cold. There's not a lot of heart and emotion in what they write. It's all very cold and analytical, and they're always analyzing and talking philosophically. Everybody sounds like they're reading from a fortune cookie. You know, all the dialogue is like, how do you feel right now? What is feeling? What is it to feel and be alive? Like, that's how the characters in everything they make ever always end up talking. Like, they don't really talk like normal people. And that can be frustrating for a lot of people. It was for me at first. I had to muscle my way past that. But once you muscle your way past that, you are treated to one of the most complex, brilliant, intelligent shows I have ever seen. And I have to stress those three words. I really have to stress them particularly complex because Westworld can get very complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of mind-bending twists where you have to watch the show over again to be like, oh, so that's what that meant. Because they they play with you a lot. They play with your mind a lot. A lot of people probably won't understand Westworld, and that's okay. It's okay if you don't understand it. It is very complicated stuff. But it is well worth the effort, because if it does resonate with you, God, you're going to have so much fun. And I'm actually jealous that you get to experience it for the first time if you haven't done so already. Apparently, it's going to be five seasons when all is said and done. Uh, Right now, there are only two seasons out, but the third season actually debuts three days from when I'm recording this. Third season debuts on March 15th. So I am really, really excited. And as if you needed any further incentive to try this show out, Anthony Hopkins is in it. That There you go. Anthony Hopkins is in it. Have fun. Now, finally, let's cross over into the world of our newest uh, streamer which I just right now decided is what I'm going to call them, Disney Plus. Now, as it stands, 
Disney Plus might have the smallest catalog because of just how new it is, but I still don't think it's the most limited catalog. I still think that the most limited catalog would be Amazon Prime because there's really a lot of garbage on Amazon Prime. Disney's catalog is small volume wise, but there's a lot of gems sprinkled in there. Because the homepage of Disney Plus is always throwing the splashy stuff at you. It's always throwing Star Wars. It's always throwing Marvel. It's always throwing like Diary of a Future President and all those little tweeny family channel shows that they like to pimp out. But uh, you, you got to do a little bit of work in Disney Plus before you find the good stuff. And the first night I got it, I remember spending like an hour just going through the menu, going through stuff, searching stuff because some stuff doesn't come up on the menu. And finding little hidden gems. One of them that I want to recommend is a movie called Big Business. This is uh, an 80s movie. I think an early 80s movie. And Big Business stars Lily Tomlin and Bette Midler as two sets of identical twins who get switched at birth. And then the whole thing is just a comedy of errors as these four ladies uh, keep missing each other and don't realize that there are two sets of each one. It's it's just, it is so much fun. Uh, It's a typical old school comedy the kind they used to make in the 80s and they don't make anymore. The first day I ever got Disney Plus, I watched The Mandalorian. I watched an episode of Jeff Goldblum, World According to Jeff Goldblum, which is just like a little National Geographic kind of documentary show. And then I watched Big Business. And as much as I loved the first two, I think I had the biggest smile on my face during Big Business. And that's just one of the many little gem movies you're going to find if you dig through sort of the, the darker corners of Disney Plus. If you have kids and or if you were a 90s kid and you're very nostalgic, guess what? Somebody's probably already told you this, but I'm going to tell you again anyway, because that's my job right now. Disney Plus has the full catalog of the 90s cartoon Gargoyles. Now, when I discovered this, I spent two and a half months binge watching Gargoyles. And I didn't watch the show much as a kid. I only saw like one or two episodes, so I didn't really have strong memories of it. But watching it now as an adult, I couldn't help but realize how well made it was. Gargoyles is, with this hindsight now, seeing it one of the best cartoons to come out of the 90s, I think, in terms of, you know, cartoons for younger viewers. It takes a cue from stuff like Batman the Animated Series where it's darker tonally. uh, It's not pandering to your kids. It's not trying to throw sunshine and rainbows at them. It's trying to tell a superhero kind of story in a mature way, but still in a kid-friendly way. And that's a hard line to walk, but if you can walk that line, then you're golden. And trust me, guys, Gargoyles is golden. So bring the kids to watch it, or just watch it yourself if you're, you know, pining for the good old days of the 1990s. Gargoyles is a treat. The story arc that starts in the first episode of Gargoyles continues all the way up until the last episode, which is something that a lot of cartoons never really bothered doing. They never really bothered kind of building a cohesive cause and effect universe. Even the superhero ones, it was mostly just like, this week, here's another villain. And the hero beat them. The end. This was different. And I can't really stress how different it was, but once you watch it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It just, it it has, uh, it has a writing team behind it that knew what they were doing. And it's a shame that Gargoyles didn't take off and become as hot as I think it deserved to be. But my final suggestion, guys, my piece de resistance here um, in terms of Disney Plus, and you know what, in terms of all the other streamers, uh, because I think that this is the the binge to end all binges. I think that if you're if you end up quarantining yourself for three weeks or more, this is going to be your saving grace. And it's nothing more and nothing less than something we've all heard of, guys. It's The Simpsons, man. Cowabunga. I'm not a fan of monopolies. I'm still a little bit sad that Disney bought out Fox. It's sad when that happens. You know, I I don't like seeing somebody scoop up all the power. But the one saving grace, the one thing that made me say, okay, I'm a little bit happy that Disney bought Fox, is the fact that on Disney Plus right now, you can watch every single damn episode of The Simpsons. And folks, if you're keeping track, that is somewhere in the ballpark of 700 episodes, I think. The Simpsons has been on for 31 seasons. If I remember right, 31 seasons of the show with more to come. And they are 
all on Disney Plus. And these are not small seasons. The Simpsons is old school. It operates and schedules its time slots in an old school way. They order 22, sometimes 23 episodes every year. A lot of shows don't do that anymore. They go for smaller seasons with tighter storytelling. But Simpsons doesn't work like that. Simpsons doesn't care about tight storytelling. Simpsons doesn't have arcs that flow over a season. Every episode is just a one and done thing. In 31 years, the only time they've ever created a story that lasted more than one episode was Who Shot Mr. Burns Part 1 and 2. Apart from that, everything is just a self-contained 21-minute adventure. And there are 700 of those on Disney Plus right now. Since I got Disney Plus, I have been working my way through every episode of Simpsons that I have not seen yet. Because a lot of us dropped off after a while, right? We all saw the classic, you know, first nine years of the show. And then we all just kind of let the show fall by the wayside. And I was the same way. I had seen about 15 seasons of the show and then I stopped. So once Disney Plus came around, I started picking up where I left off. Right now I'm on season 21, which sounds like a lot. Season 21. I'm in the middle of season 21 and guess what? I have 10 seasons left to go. So that's still a lot of Simpsons I have ahead of me. And yeah, some of them are weak. Some of these new ones are weak, but a lot of them are still going strong. And I'm going to actually put this out there. To anybody who hates on The Simpsons because they say it's not funny anymore, go on Disney Plus and watch season 19. I believe The Simpsons season 19 is so good, it is worthy of standing next to the classic seasons of the show. It is worthy to be up there next to season 8 and season 3 and season 5. Season 19 flat out rocks. And I think the reason for that was because It's the one season that aired right after the movie came out. So maybe they were like trying harder. They were like, wow, the world still loves us, guys. Let's let's put some more effort into it. That's the only reason I can think of because they really were firing on all cylinders in season 19. But if 31 seasons of a show can't keep you satisfied for however long you decide to hold up in your house, then I don't think anything will. So I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I'm going to make that my final recommendation of the day and that's going to be all for this episode i I think that those uh those should keep you busy for a while those should keep you content it's a lot of entertainment and i know you probably have kids running around and they might get bored and they might want to switch it up and that's okay so i hope that however long you end up in your house you know however long you're holed up with no school no work etc i just hope that you are all staying safe staying sane staying healthy and above all staying fun. Make that home a fun place to be. If you're going to be stuck there for two weeks, three weeks, make it a fun place to be. And we here at Rebel Scum Podcast, we're going to do our best to make it a fun place to be too. We're going to put out a lot of stuff for you to occupy your time with so you can hear our tender voices and see our handsome scratchy faces as much as possible. I'm Andrew Fantasia. Enjoy those streaming recommendations. And this has been So Wizard. (laughs) 